Before we get started, I just wanted to mention something that came up a couple times in the last week. This is some spoiler material for the last episode of Reasonably Sound about Brahms, so if you haven't listened, I'm going to give you a chance to skip ahead right now. I'm going to pause. I'm going to wait. Okay, so Mark Gray on Twitter and Max B in the comments section on ReasonablySound.com both pointed out that the horn sounds made by the aliens which visit Earth in Steven Spielberg's 1977 film Close Encounters of the Third Kind are actually rather brahmy. Or, as Mara Katz put it on Twitter in another context, Brahminus. I'm inclined to agree, and I think there's something to be said about Aura D. Nichols originating the shape and overall impact, Close Encounters establishing the instrumentation, War of the Worlds 2005 combining the two, and Inception sending the Brahm off to the movie trailer races. So as you all encounter more Brahms out there in the world, especially in cinema, keep them coming my way. This kind of community audio archaeology is a blast. All right, on to the episode. When we got our dog Jack almost five years ago, he was already house trained. We picked him out at the shelter because he was the only one who wasn't barking. And once we got him home, he was actually a pretty quick study. Sit, lie down, roll over. He learned stay, up and down off the furniture, jump. We even managed to teach him high five, where if you put both hands out, he stands on his hind legs and gives you, well, 10, or I guess eight, technically. Jack's not a stickler for accuracy, so it's not a big deal. We ended up not click training Jack, though we did talk about it. That's where when you give your dog a command, if they successfully obey, you click a little dongle with a button on it. It sounds like this. And then you give them a treat. And after a while, your dog will learn that clicks mean good job and that treats are en route, so they're going to want to obey. After a while with the clicker, especially with intense training, the treats become unnecessary. The click becomes synonymous with praise. The clicker is good because it's instant, and it doesn't distract from the task at hand. It's a way to give approval and, in a way, reward your dog without actually rewarding them. It's a weird kind of sonic reward signal. The clicker is a classic and one of the more commonly known examples of operant conditioning. But before we talk about that, it's probably a good idea to talk about the other, more widely known classical conditioning also widely associated with dogs, via Mr. Ivan Petrovich Pavlov. That is what this episode of Reasonably Sound is about. How seemingly innocuous sounds get laden with meaning and can be used to guide behavior. Mostly we're going to talk about dogs, but towards the end, we'll see how this applies to people in a very specific way. First though, Pavlov. In 1901, Pavlov, a Russian-born physiologist, noticed that dogs involved in the digestion research he was doing would salivate when the technicians who fed them were in view, even if those techs didn't have snacks. Pavlov called this psychic secretion, which is just, I mean, that, that sounds like something from a Ghostbusters movie, psychic secretion, like it's, like it's oozing down the walls and someone takes out an instrument and then they scrape some away and there's beeping noises and they go, yep, it's psychic secretion, all right, there's a class four specter nearby. Anyway, Pavlov figured he could make the whole arrangement, dogs, drool, food, technicians, happen on purpose. He used several stimuli. Pavlov biographer Daniel P. Toads wrote of a metronome, a harmonium, a buzzer, and electric shock. 
Elsewhere, I've seen accounts of him using tuning forks, and apparently there's even some long-standing controversy as to whether or not Pavlov ever used a bell. I know, serious drama. Whatever the audio apparatus Pavlov used, the situation works because of relationships built between two stimuli and two responses. So I'm going to be perfectly honest, I have an absurdly hard time wrapping my head around this. So we're going to go slow. Here we go. The unconditioned stimulus is that which has no previous association. Okay, all right, just kidding. Okay, for real this time. Stimulus and response in classical, aka Pavlovian conditioning. An unconditioned stimulus has no previous association. Plain old kibbles, let's say, before any bells have been rung, before any delicious technicians. Unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned response is the natural reaction a dog has to that unconditioned stimulus. Whatever reflex a dog, having not been trained in any way, would have to the presence of food, aka drooling. That's unconditioned response. Over time, and after lots and lots of repetition, that response can be produced by another kind of stimulus. This other kind of stimulus is a sound, the presence of a human, etc., which over time gets associated with food. Kibble, bell, kibble, bell, kibble, bell, until bell becomes a conditioned stimulus. The conditioned response is the reaction the dog has to it. The drool a dog drools after hearing the bell or metronome or harmonium in the absence of food once it has been successfully associated with food. Conditioned stimulus causes conditioned response after repetition. Pavlov even discovered that conditioned response drool is of a different composition than unconditioned response drool. So in this case, at least, they are actually two different things, not just two versions of the same thing. This is not how the clicker works. It seems like it should be how it works. Click, treat, click, treat, click, treat, and after a while, click, no treat, but still reflexive excitement about food akin to praise. Not quite, though. Classical conditioning, Pavlov and his bell, or not, depending upon where you stand with regards to bell gate, is all about reflex. Things done unconsciously. The clicker is an example of operant conditioning. It's about encouragement and reinforcement of purposeful, conscious behavior. I might say it's a little bit more about learning. <music> Classical and operant conditioning are two of many processes by which learning happens. They're both examples of associative learning. Classical conditioning is more passive, let's say. It makes and reinforces associations between stimuli and reflex, something that happens without thought. This is learning in a somewhat unfamiliar sense, I think. To some degree, it's learning without knowing, which, I mean, okay, we're about to jump down a semantic rabbit hole here, so let's just back away while all agreeing that as far as what's meant when we talk about learning, conditioning reflexes isn't normally that. Operant conditioning, like click training, still isn't the memorization of facts. It's not the kind of learning we do by reading books and listening to podcasts, but neither is its outcome so categorically unrelated. An example is going to be really helpful here, I think. And while the clicker is a good one, something called the Skinner box is a classic one. The Skinner box is named after B.F. Skinner, who invented it when he was a grad student at Harvard in the early 30s. And it was literally a box in which Skinner and his assistants would put a subject, an animal, a rodent, maybe a pigeon. The box has something that provides stimuli, like a light, and a button or a switch called an operandum. If the subject hits the button when the light shines, a reward is dropped into the box. And the reward is called, conveniently, a reinforcer. The goal is to train the subject to hit the button when the signal goes off by rewarding it for doing so. The simplest Skinner boxes are, well, simple. One light, one switch, one treat. But complex versions can have multiple stimuli, operanda, and reinforcers in all kinds of complex causal relationships. 
One of the things Skinner and his team learned is that if it is reliably the case that when a stimulus is triggered and the subject manipulates the operandum, a single reinforcer is pooped out, eventually the subject only responds to the stimulus when they're hungry. If the size or number of reinforcers is varied, though, and tuned just right over the course of many stimuli, the subject remains interested for a longer period of time. This is the principle upon which slot machines are built. There's an episode about those in the works, by the way. Anyway, the Skinner box, which Skinner apparently did not want named after him, but whoops, sorry dude, has wide implications for modern social media and entertainment technology too, which is all about supplying a steady stream of differently weighted rewards as long as you continue taking correct actions. A rewarding yet ultimately empty video game, for instance, a Candy Crush saga, or even some larger open world games may be criticized as glorified Skinner boxes for preying on an inbuilt desire to check things off lists and revel in simple accomplishments which amount to not much more than clicking the right button when a light goes off and being told, yay, you did it. I'd love it if my PC pooped out real treats every time I unlocked an achievement in a video game. Can someone build that? Facebook and Twitter operate, arguably, on a similar principle, teaching us to return for pellets of satisfaction and rewarding the constant clicking of the right buttons when told to by brightly colored lights or notifications, as the case may be. So, in a way, operant conditioning is still the development of knowledge about how the world works and the best way to interact with it for our given purposes. Playing games, getting information, communicating with others. It's closer to how we think about learning in general in that it involves intention. We take an action in response to an event, are presented with the consequences, and adjust our future actions based on those consequences. It is creating meaning and associations between things, often so that one can be an effective actor in their chosen environment. To return to our canine example, with a clicker, Non-reflexive behavior, like sit, shake, high-five, or eight, is encouraged by associating a click sound with positivity, like food. In fancy terms, that's a primary reinforcer, the food, associated with a conditioned reinforcer, the clicker. And once that association between primary reinforcer and conditioned reinforcer is strong, the primary reinforcer can go away. The sound isn't associated with something positive, it effectively becomes something positive. And just for the record, operant conditioning doesn't specify that the response to any given behavior must be positive. It's just, you know, nicer if it is. A shock collar, for instance, can be used to guide behavior, but, um, you know, that involves one major drawback, which is electrical shocks. So just to summarize, what Pavlov did is about triggering reflexive response by constructing and reinforcing associations. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is about guiding intentional behavior by associating actions with signals and consequences which the subject eventually learns. Another example of this kind of conditioning involves dog whistles. Your stereotypical dog whistle is ultrasonic, meaning its tone is above the range of normal human hearing. People ears top out at around 20 kilohertz, and ultrasonic dog whistles are in the 20 to 50 kilohertz range. The one that I have is adjustable from audible to inaudible. It sounds like this when it's set in the high range. It may actually, now that I think about it, its sound might be above the frequency response of my microphone, so that probably just sounds like me exhaling violently, but I promise there's a high tone in there. It gets Jack's attention instantly. It is like magic. 
Cats can hear these silent dog whistles too, by the way. Dog hearing ends at around 45 kilohertz, but some cats can hear up to 79 kilohertz. It's so they can hear the tiny squeaks of their unsuspecting prey. Those tiny, fluffy monsters. Anyway, dog whistles, which are also cat whistles, work sort of like the clicker, just louder and with a much more specific purpose. The clicker is for everything. The subject does good, they get clicked. The whistle is used to praise and encourage specific commands. They're intended to cause a desired reaction, not as a general conditioned reinforcer signaling that someone is a good boy, yes they are. Training methods vary, but in essence, the subject does something you want them to do. You blow the whistle and reward them with a treat. You repeat this lots and lots, building the association in many different situations until even in a busy, distracting environment, you blow the whistle and you get results. Return, heal, get me a soda from the corner, etc. The good thing about dog whistles, especially ultrasonic ones, is that their sound cuts through other sounds. So it's easy for the subject to hear. And all the promotional literature for dog whistles also point out that they don't get tired or mad. Two things which will affect the tone of the human voice, and therefore the likelihood the subject will understand or feel inclined to obey. If your dog, for instance, knows what you really mean, God damn it, dog, I don't need this right now. Get back here this instant. They're more likely to regard you with skepticism or downright refusal. I mean, they probably don't want to return, but... It's not really about what they want, right? The dog whistle sends a message loud and clear to exactly who it's meant for. And ideally, no one else can even hear it. And assuming you put the work in first, it makes it much more likely that the subject will respond in exactly the way you want them to. This brings us to racism. We're going to use all that newfound expertise about conditioning, stimuli, reinforcers, and yes, literal dog whistles in perhaps an unexpected way to talk about politics, mostly American politics. But what we're going to talk about is applicable in many situations. Over the last year, you may have heard increasingly about dog whistle politics. If not, I'm going to include a bunch of links in the show notes and at reasonablysound.com, enough hopefully to show you that it's been a rather present and pressing topic. To hear it described, dog whistle politics is a way for politicians to send a message which, much like a real dog whistle, has meaning for the subjects who are trained, I'm using quote fingers here, to understand it and to appear otherwise innocuous or not at all to those who aren't. What kinds of messages, you may ask? All kinds. Anything, really, as long as the work is put in. But there does tend to be a certain subset of topics which are communicated this way. Statements of harsh judgment, or really downright hate. Mostly of specific identity groups, based on class, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or religion. This is unfortunate, to put it lightly, but makes an amount of sense as a public figure, especially a politician, to judge people outright or to admit and encourage hatefulness, one risks alienating moderate supporters who are likely the bulk. But if you could construct a message so that moderates don't hear it or don't understand it, but the hateful do, that's like having your cake and eating it too. But okay, this sounds like some Illuminati right? People are claiming that there are public figures sending secret messages to certain portions of their audience or constituents or voters or whatever, while another portion is none the wiser. How could that possibly work? Well, I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm going to let a politician explain it to you. Specifically, Lee Atwater, an American political consultant and strategist. Atwater gave this interview to political scientist Alexander P. Lammas in 1981 about the history of what came to be known as the Southern Strategy. Before warned, this clip contains hateful and offensive language. Uh, here's, how, here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist. Or, no, as a psychologist, which I'm not. 
is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, in, and now y'all aren't quoting me. I won't do this. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like uh, forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, uh, that, that, we're, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. Uh, you follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying, uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never knew, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. Dog whistle politics sneakily allude to many identity groups, but racially charged messages, like the ones Atwater mentions, outnumber the others. So that's what we're going to use as our example, racial dog whistles. However, before we get too far, I want to digress for a moment to point out that dog whistles are being increasingly traded in for sirens. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's remarks which opened his presidential campaign are used as a paradigmatic example of a recent shift from coded racist statements back to explicit ones. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. It only makes common sense. They're sending us not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. Though there will always be examples of, and maybe even a current shift to, foghorn politics, it's still useful to understand how political dog whistles work since they've played a role in fomenting the current political, media, and discursive climate, and will continue to be a tactic used by many public figures in attempts to engage discreetly, but widely, in racism, xenophobia, classism, homophobia, and so on. So the shift that Atwater discusses, from explicit to coded racism, has to do with the wider public's growing distaste for overt hate. Where at one point it was publicly acceptable for a politician to berate entire groups of people, today that would ideally paint them as a fringe lunatic unfit for office. Nevertheless, today it is also true that many people who vote harbor explicit hatred for people of color, and there often remains, even in people who are not explicitly hateful, even in people like me, who fancy themselves well-meaning progressives, there remains an understanding of the world that defends the quote-unquote truth of racial stereotypes. The trick to racial dog whistle politics, then, is saying stuff which seems non-controversial or silent to those who aren't overt racists, but which comes across loud and clear, confirms and validates the views of overt racists. Politicians can then use the power derived from that united group of potentially unlike-minded people in order to do the politics. And I also, I want to be super clear that this is not the domain of a single political party. Representatives of the left and the right traffic in this rhetoric. Though the Southern strategy implicates Republicans directly, its techniques were first demonstrated by George Wallace, the Democratic governor of Alabama in the 60s. And dog whistle politics have been seen across the political spectrum ever since. To demonstrate how this works, I'm going to read three sets of dog whistles, each with three terms. I'm not going to say what group of people each set refers to, but... I bet you'll know, especially if you're an American who watches the news or someone who is the target of these dog whistles. I'm sorry to be putting you through this and that you have to go through this at all, ever in any situation. I'm just, I'm just in general, I'm sorry. The thing to keep in mind is that none of what I'm about to say 
is explicitly racial. None of the terms, I want to be super clear about this, none directly reference race. Ready? Here's set one. Thug. Inner city. Welfare. Here's set two. American jobs. Protect our borders. Illegals. And set three. Terrorists. Sharia law. Islam. Now, at this point, you may have two concerns. First, it might seem like I'm saying anyone who says the phrases American jobs or inner city is a racist. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that each of these phrases is a signal to those who can hear it, which indicates that racially charged points are likely being made. For instance, Lee Atwater knew that forced busing meant literally the practice of putting mostly African-American kids on buses to speed up the process of school integration after Brown versus the Board of Education. But he also knew that when the right person said it in the right context, it meant to some people threats to your school, your children, their education, and safety due to government-mandated inclusion of people you hate. So, is saying forced busing itself racist? Maybe not overtly, but it can help make racist points or defend racist policies. Your second concern about my test might be that it was unfair. If you got one term in each set, you got the whole set. And okay, guilty as charged, but that's how it works in the real, not a podcast world too, when it's done by politicians and media organizations. If I say illegals, which is itself an awful and dehumanizing epithet, knowing that you'll think of Mexican and South American immigrants, and then I repeat American jobs and protect our borders over and over and over again within the same argument, I've successfully associated an immigrant population with two seemingly innocuous terms, and I've never once actually mentioned race. These two points reflect the absolute rhetorical brilliance of dog whistle racism, and part one of why the dog whistle metaphor is so apt. The racial dog whistler can make and often benefit from racially charged rhetoric and reasonably state that they have never once mentioned race. They have been, in effect, racially silent, though a message has been sent loud and clear to those who know how to hear it. And if you call them out, they can even turn it around. How dare you? associate perfectly innocent phrases with an entire race of people you, friend, are the racist here. Part one of the dog whistle metaphor is its sonic content, a signal outside the figurative hearing range of certain listeners. We're going to finish this episode talking about the second half of the metaphor, why some people can't hear the signal, how those who do hear it respond, and why politicians might even do this at all anyway. The answer isn't what you assume, I don't think, assuming that I'm assuming what you're assuming correctly. So remember the Skinner box? Remember how some people figured out that if you tune it just right, subjects will stay engaged? They'll spend hours with it, even if they don't really want to? Well, among slot machines and mobile phone games, the news media complex has figured this out too. Mostly we're going to focus on the role of televised cable and internet news here. The first step is to create an environment where audiences rely on the news. It's not only going to keep them entertained, it's also going to keep them safe. This involves overblown leads, pandering to fear, claims about exclusive insight, and even cynical details like underscoring mundane news updates with exciting cinematic music. But most importantly, 
It means agreeing with their audience, or at least appearing to agree with them. A surefire way to get someone to tune out is to say something that complicates their values. So this approach generates coverage that feels imperative and which uncritically reinforces wide-ranging stereotypes by rarely, if ever, refuting them. This is stuff like discussions of welfare reform while showing only black families, discussions of terrorism only in relationship to the Middle East or Islam. After endless repetition, these relationships between African Americans and welfare, between Islam and terrorism, become normal to the public even though, according to a report published by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the percentage of white and black welfare recipients is roughly equal. Even though in the last 15 years there have been more instances of far-right-inspired domestic terrorism in the U.S. than not. Racial stereotypes become a kind of truth after endless repetition by media sources or individuals with media platforms who are left unchallenged. This is an important part of this whole thing. Even if media organizations don't engage in these equivalencies directly, if they host people who do, politicians, say, or their surrogates, and they don't challenge these equivalencies, that's enough. So this whole process, endlessly repeated racial equivalencies, is the light in the Skinner box. The stimulus. So when the stimulus is triggered... The minority becoming the majority at one community pool. Sharia law is now changing everything. What button does the subject push? They push the share button. Stereotypes that appear true after endless repetition become completely uncontroversial talking points. Out at drinks with friends, on Twitter, or on Facebook. That is the operandum. And the reinforcer that's pooped out? It's agreement, it's likes, it's retweets, it's simply just in-group acceptance. When the stimulus goes off again. Well, look, I think we've seen it. It's, it's Baltimore, it is Ferguson, it's New York, it's Chicago. Interestingly, though, it's not Charlotte, right? It's not other cities where family and faith seem to play a role in the nature of the city itself. The process repeats. Agreement, approval, or simply no indication that otherwise might actually be the case. So in this process, the news and politicians on it become linked with behaviors that result in reward from the subject's environment. This is someone who doesn't hear the dog whistle when it is blown by a politician. They would be aghast if you asked, are you racist? They don't hate anyone. How dare you? And probably they don't. They just have some implicit biases. It's another phrase you've maybe encountered around. They are biased to unconsciously assume that certain statements imply a specific group of people when they don't. To put this another way, racism might not be an admitted part of their identity, though through repeated messages, hallmarks of it can find a way into their actions. In fact, research has shown that when messages aligning with someone's implicit biases become explicitly racial, people tend to react very negatively. If the whistle turns to a siren, they can hear it, and they don't like it. But what about people who do hear the whistle and agree with its message? Public figures in the media have made the strong association between seemingly innocuous phrases and a group of people the dog whistle hearer actively hates. When a politician blows the dog whistle and says terrorist, they post on Facebook about rounding up everyone who looks like whatever they think a follower of Islam looks like. A politician blows the welfare queen dog whistle, a famous example from Ronald Reagan in the 80s, and they fume at the gall of African Americans somehow living lavishly off government handouts. Law and order. War on drugs states' rights. These phrases let racists know which politicians are on their side. Sort of. On their side in the sense that these dog whistles indicate agreements about certain races of people and how the government should treat them. They're going to think a dog whistling politician is in their corner, supporting their way of life, is going to help them prosper in a safe, fair country of people who look like they do. Let's just think through this for a second. 
If overt racists don't make up the base, and most people recoil at explicitly racist remarks, why would a politician blow the dog whistle? Why perpetuate this whole thing? Why not abandon the racists and let them live out their lives knowing that no mainstream politician supports their views? It's because certain politicians need racism. And people who support are tolerant of or blind to racism, who see racist policies as common sense. Because certain politicians, their careers and their policies, they benefit from social inequality. So they have to maintain the division which results from racism while abandoning racist banner waving. Does dog whistle politics alone win elections? No, it doesn't. But does it help? And does it protect advantage along the way? Yes, it does. In his book, Dog Whistle Politics, Ian Haney Lopez explains that dog whistle politics aren't just about hate, but also power. Many politicians traffic in what Lopez calls strategic racism. Quote, In pursuit of land and labor, power, wealth, and status, self-interested parties fashioned racial beliefs about whites, blacks, and reds in the first place. Repeatedly thereafter, strategic racists adapted racism to protect their advantages and to pursue additional interests. And then later he writes, Dog whistle politics exploits race in an effort to lure citizens into voting for politicians allied with the rich and powerful. Prejudice of many kinds has contributed to a consolidation of wealth and power in a very specific group of people. So it's in their interest to maintain that prejudice, or at the very least, its effects. And they do this by establishing and maintaining public support for policies which seem common sense to some, thanks to the work that they and the media have done, and confirms the prejudices of others. If you can't hear the whistle, sounds like everything is normal. That's just how the world works. If you can hear the whistle and you agree with its message, it sounds like your interests are being protected. But really, the blower of the whistle is protecting their own interests approving tax breaks for their bracket and not lower incomes, keeping jails full so the incarceration system can print money, privatizing schools and defunding public programs so that their private sector chums can profit. Dog-whistling politicians have helped turn racist ideals into what seem like common sense policy decisions, which are then sold to many voters as a pathway to prosperity. And they are pathways to prosperity, but not for anyone in the working class, regardless of their race. Dog whistles are signals blown by politicians in the hopes of guiding voter behavior for political gain. That's the second half of the dog whistle metaphor. Accordingly, we might ask what it means to want to respond to dog whistle politics if those who do are subject to an environment where it is so closely linked to reward and its opposite to injustice or lack of reason. I don't mean to take responsibility away from hateful citizens who always have it within their power to change. I only mean to distribute responsibility to the systems and figureheads which nurture and motivate hateful citizens while making them feel trapped and in many cases while actually trapping them. It is the case with both kinds of dog whistle, ultrasonic and political, that over time and in many different situations, subjects learn how to respond to signals out of the range of normal hearing. This is that very specific kind of learning, not active learning, not books and podcast learning, but learning through repetition and consequence about how to be an effective participant in their environment. Learning to respond to those signals in a way associated with positivity and the promise of reward, even if that reward is ultimately someone else's.
My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been reasonably sound. If you want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Even a dollar per episode is super helpful to offset the costs of research and hosting and all that other fun stuff. You can also find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at reasonably SND, and you can find me on most social media at Mike Rignetta. Reasonably Sound's music is by Will Stratton and visual design by Tita Tep. Extra double special thanks to Mr. Matt Moraine for his help with this episode. <laughs>